Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. Welcome to tutorial number 21. Today I'm going to show you how to ride a fire simulator. I've never done this in my entire career, so I thought, let's give it a try. This is my result. It's not perfect, but I'm quite happy with it. As usually, I wrote it in JavaScript, so you can immediately play with it in your browser. The direct link is in the description. The fire simulator I will show you here is based on an Eulerian fluid simulator. It's the one that I discussed in tutorial number 17. So I highly recommend that you watch this tutorial first, how to write an Eulerian fluid simulator. However, I will give you a very brief recap of that method. A fluid is a liquid or a gas. In tutorial 17, we looked at passive fluids that are just pushed around. Today, we look at active fluids gas that is burning. In the Eulerian fluid simulation method, a fluid is represented by a velocity field stored on a grid. In two dimensions, the velocity has two components, u and v. We are going to use a staggered grid. In this grid, the two velocity components are not stored in the same location. The horizontal component u is stored at the center of the vertical faces. The vertical component V is stored at the center of the horizontal faces. Here is an overview of the Eulerian fluid simulation method. There are three steps. The first step is to modify the velocity field, for instance, to add gravity or external forces. The second step is called projection. Here we make sure that the fluid is incompressible. The last step is the advection step. Here, we move the velocity field as well as a smoke density field along the velocity field in the grid. So the first step is the simplest one. For instance, if we want to add the gravitational acceleration, we simply go through all the cells. Then we add delta t times g to the vertical components v stored in the cells. Here, delta t is the time step size. And g is the gravitational acceleration, which is about 9.81 meters per second squared. The second step is projection. Here, we make the fluid incompressible. For this, we run through all the cells in the grid. For each cell, we compute the total outflow, which is also called the divergence. This is a formula to compute this quantity. In this example here, the total outflow or divergence is positive. There is more fluid flowing out of the cell than into the cell. So we have too much outflow. In this example here, the divergence or the total outflow is negative. There is too much fluid flowing into the cell. Only if the divergence or the total outflow is zero, then the fluid is incompressible. Now, how can we force incompressibility in the grid? Here we have a grid cell with too much inflow. What we could do is just modify one velocity component to make the inflow zero. However, a fluid cannot do that. We need to push all the velocity at the same time by the same amount. To get a global solution, we have to iterate through all the cells multiple times. We also have to consider boundary conditions. For this, have a look at tutorial number 17. The last step is the advection step. Here, we want to move quantities such as the density of the velocity components along the velocity field stored in the grid. So let's assume we have a quantity Q. This could be the density value or a velocity component. If it's a density, then it is stored at the center of the cells. If it's a velocity component, then it is stored at the center of the faces of the cells. In order to compute the value of Q at the current time step t, we need to know what the value was at the previous time step, t minus 1. For this, we trace q backwards in time. We can compute the position of q at the previous time step x t minus 1 by subtracting the velocity times the time step size from the current position. Here we assume that q traveled in a straight line, which is an approximation. The location x t minus v t times delta t is not necessarily located at the center of the cell or at the center of a face. Therefore, to compute this value, we need to compute a weighted average of the values around it. Here is an overview of the fire simulation method. We modify the first step and add a fourth step. In the first step, we modify the velocity field as before. 
but this time, instead of gravity, we add lift forces and turbulence. In the second step, we make the velocity field incompressible as before. In the third step, we advect the velocity and temperature fields. So instead of having a smoke density field, we have a temperature field. In the fourth step, we modify the temperature field due to burning and cooling. I simplified physics a bit. In reality, there are multiple fields, such as fuel, temperature and a smoke field. We use only one field, which is a normalized temperature field. It has values between 1 and 0. For values between 1 and 0.3, we consider the field to represent a burning gas. Between 0.3 and 0, it represents smoke. The value decreases over time. We use three color gradients to render it. One between yellow and red, one between red and gray, and one between gray and black. At every time step, we initialize t to be 1 at fire sources. We decrease t over time by subtracting a cooling rate times delta t and have to make sure that the temperature doesn't go below zero. I use two different cooling rates for fire and smoke. Then we add t along the fluid velocity. The temperature field has an influence on the velocities in the grid. We first compute an upwards target velocity v target. This is v lift times t. V lift is a parameter. As you can see, the target velocity increases with t. Once you have the target velocity v target, we drive the current velocity v towards this target velocity. Here we use an acceleration a. So we have two parameters to tune, v lift and the acceleration a. So let's assume we have a burning floor, which means all the values at the bottom are 1. When we run the simulation, we get this pattern. Of course, this is not very interesting. What we need are external influences and we need to enhance turbulence. We do this by introducing swirls. A swirl has a position x, a radius r, an angular velocity omega and an h. Swirls are created with a given probability at fire source cells. Then they are advected using the velocity field in the grid. When they reach their maximum h, they are deleted. Let me now show you how swirls influence the velocity field in the grid. Let's assume that we have a swirl at position x swirl and it influences a grid velocity component at position x grid. Let bold d be the vector between x swirl and x grid and d its length. We can now use these two statements to update the grid velocity components at x grid. The equations pull the current grid velocity components towards the swirl velocity at their locations. The strength of this effect is defined by a kernel function k. k depends on the distance d between the swirl center and x grid. The function yields a value between 0 and 1. It is 0 when d is larger than the swirl radius. I use a very simple kernel function. It is 1 up to a distance of 0.8 times the swirl radius. Then it decreases linearly to 0. This concludes the tutorial. I hope you had fun. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.